there's key records in every part that music yeah. maps your life mate right generally if you're a music person you will remember moments in your life where certain records will play and they'll they'll ring they'll they will resonate because it has an emotional attachment to that particular moment um, i mean look, a key track electro track for me which i love is play at your own risk oh yeah which planet, is, uh, planet, um, planet Patrol. Patrol, yeah. Planet Patrol, yeah, they've been going for years. I mean, I used to see JFM and Victor and all those sort of, I mean, they were, they created the underground dance scene, didn't they? I mean, without those radio stations, you know, not half of these records wouldn't get played. A massive business was created by like, for the, you know, the flying squad used to deliver the big packs of flyers. They created a massive business out of well, that. I remember going to, I was a member of flying and we used to go flying a lot and all that. I uh, started flying, you know that? No. Me, Dean Thatcher and Charlie Chester. Alex was uh, playing and I walked in and put something on the, the, the turntable before the record finished and he had to get rid of it, if you know what I'm saying. And he, I went, I'm Brandon Block, nice to meet you. That was our intro. Oh, but when I was at normal, not a night bus, a normal passenger bus. The driver had gone to the toilet. he come out of pasture for what I can't get home, so he jumped on the bus and drove it to San Ann for the people. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, instrumental making a daytime party in a thing. Yeah. You know, that's the first day, the first uh, after hours in the world on a journey to do away with myself. And I was ready to accept that, but it wasn't happening. And I was getting more and more pain from the physical illness that I knew I needed to go. And I went on the Monday morning after that mental weekend that I had. And I actually DJed at the Ministry of Sound the night before I went in. And I had about, I can't even, I won't even tell you how much I took, but it was way out of the league, way out of my league for that. It was like a, a, the last try, let's say. It was like the last supper. It was like the last supper, last mm. supper. Last, last supper. supper. On this week's show, we have DJ and producer from back in the day who's played up and down the UK as well as uh, Ibiza with his wicked house sets, who stirs up the crowd into a frenzy on the dance floor and was a real trailblazer, a party animal like a rampant beast that could not be tamed and came the devil's dandruff so much that he was only given uh, two weeks to live. He see the light, completely turned his life around and is now helping people People who suffer with drink and drug addiction and is pushing positivity. We have the larger than life character, an all round diamond geezer. I'm excited to say we've got the one and the only Brandon Block in the place. Woo! Ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah. That's Woo! A lovely, lovely intro. I loved it. <laughs> oi, oi, Savaloy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Listen, listen, Brandon, it's a real honour. I, I, I'm really proud of, of what you're doing. You know, we're going to be touching on, you know, some of your early history, the growing up, the music, the raves, yeah, yeah. you know, the club culture, all that good stuff, as well as talking a little bit about what you're doing now, pushing positivity, pushing people in the right direction, which, you know, it will be a huge honour to talk about as well. And uh, we can talk about, obviously, the book you wrote as well, because I didn't even realise you wrote a book, so I need to buy your book as well. Well, mate, if you if you're, if, if you behave well, I might even send I've managed to get a few copies sent to me, so uh, I might even be able to send you one, so we'll see. Uh, well, yeah, what I'm going to say, so ba basically, Brandon, what, what I always start off with is, you know, like, basically, whereabouts are you, uh, you ain't going to start stripping off, are you? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, multi-layering. I'm going to put my, uh, my um, in camouflage. <laughs> there you go, just for this, because it could get a bit hairy. Let's go. Listen, mate, we're getting ready, for, we're getting, we're getting ready for action. So, um, yeah, basically, first two questions I always start off with is, you know, where, where that's you from and what was it like growing up, you know, as a youngster? Uh, well, originally, Steve, I was in, um, born in Hackney, uh, in the great east end of London and, uh, didn't stay there very long. I was born in Clapton. We moved to, uh, Wembley when I was quite young, where I grew up and did a lot of my, uh, which we'll talk about a spiritual bit later, but yeah, I, I mean, I had a lovely, I had a great, well, as far as I remember, I, think. I was bullied at school for, I'm only saying it because we, we, not that it matters because, you know, um, well, they may do, but you know, we, we, we know this now, we, we sort of map our lives now from what went on in our past and we, so we know that having awareness now that what went on for us back then probably 
you know, maps out what goes on for us now. So anyway, I um, I was bullied at school a little bit. All the people who bullied me turned out, we all, we all grew up together and become best mates and we hung around and, you know, God rest his soul, my best mate who was one of the people who bullied me when I was very young, took his own life two years, three years, 2020 anyway, and that was like one of the worst times. Anyway, I had a lovely, I, I really enjoyed my, my growing up. I think I, I was lucky enough to be born in the, grew up, let's say, I did my growing up in the 80s. I was born in the obviously 60s. So what music was you growing growing up on? Right, okay, so I grew up uh, on Funk and Soul. Yeah, but basically my pals were into school. There's all sorts of, uh, as I was saying, when I went back to school, when I was really, I was going to say my mates were all in Scar, and uh and uh two-tone and stuff like that and then also we was dancing there was also i've got i was introduced to the disco and funk era by my other pals in the uh school disco so basically i grew up dancing and as you said roller skating skateboarding wasn't my thing um but i was a good roller skater and we had a, we had a roller hockey team and i used to dj at the roller disco I became a marshal at the roller disco because i could you know we were really good skaters we had a nice skating team so more punk and soul and and that's how i Grew up um, musically, and then obviously started DJing by by default, actually by uh, just a, a, a lucky break, really, in the local pub. What kind of funk stuff was you listening to, like you know, you, the obvious things, like you know, James Brown and all that sort of stuff. Well, no, it was, well, I mean, the JBs was obviously the, the, the JBs Roadshow at the time, and there was also, I mean, it was across the section. It wasn't it was, um, it obviously it comes from Motown. Mm. Uh, and and soul and funk comes through, you know, Shalimar, the, you know, the, uh, Sister Sledge, um, calling the gang, Earth, Wind and Fire, all the big disco acts, all the big disco bands, all the soul and funk, and you know, there was more cutting edge stuff like the Rare Groove and um, Jazz Funk, you know, big soul artists, Luther, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, just across the board really, mate, and it was, uh, you know, it was a lovely time. Brandon, did you also get into that kind of early electro and uh, hip hop sound? Absolutely, it's a natural progression. It was like that's where musically, it, it, all those, all those sort of musical phases when they were attached to like, that. So when, if it punk went to new romantic, with new romantic, those people would follow. I mean, we were disco punk, electro was like a new and rap. You know, the first rap record, Sugar, Sugar, Sugar Hill Gang, was nineteen seventy nine. So that was well before you know the first uh, electro hip hop, let's say. But yeah, I mean. Uh, the use of the 808 and the 909 drum Ooh, machines. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of course, I love that. There's a, there, actually, I've just yesterday got a, a promo. Someone's just literally looped that old uh, sort of um, very similar to Planet Rock and done it again. And it's just fantastic to hear that stuff again. So, yeah, really lovely times. I mean that that early electro and you and you're right. It kind of all that kind of synth sound, the 808. I mean tracks like Planet Rock, Captain Rock, of the Smurf, Tyrone Brunson, all 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 them tracks. I mean they they was amazing, weren't they? I mean was there was there some key tracks that was kind of really blowing you away? You had like on repeat some of the old electro tracks. Well, I mean, I, I me and my you know me and Ricky Morrison do a radio show on uh, my soul on Fridays, and we call it the Emporium. So we sort of dip into any era just at the, on, on off the cut. So, uh, I mean, there's key records in every part. Look, music yeah. maps your life, mate, right? Generally, if you're a music person, you will remember moments in your life where certain records were played and they'll, they'll ring, they'll, they will resonate because it has an emotional attachment to that particular moment. So, I mean, for me, the electro, you know, popping, body play, I mean, I remember a lot of that because it was called The Robot, wasn't it? And um, did you do that, Brandon? Did you do a bit of a? Did you bust a few few moves? Little bastard! I wasn't great at it by any means, but um, nah. I did bust a couple of moves and, and and a bit of robot or popping, as they said. But I, I knew there was a lot of break dance crews around where we lived, so we used to have a uh, you know certain places we used to go. I loved all that. I loved it. Um, I mean, look, a key track, electro track for me, which I love, is "Play at Your Own Risk." Oh, yeah. Which planet, is, planet, um, planet Patrol. Patrol, yeah. Planet Patrol, yeah. Which is, I just it. love the vocal. I, I love those key changes, and, and it's just, it, oh, it's just a tune. I mean, when they get the cut C D C O D cover of in the bottle, and um, hip hop big bottle man. Ah, oh, don't, ah, oh, don't, Brandon. What, what a tune. Yeah. What a tune. Yeah, some. Oops, excuse me. Some great. Um, 
Some great tunes, man. Loved it. So, I mean, the, the funk scene was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, um, you know, was you going to any like underground funk clubs? Like, you know, was you going to the WAG or, or any of them clubs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, Crackers, Cheeky Pete's, uh, Bandwagon, uh, the Belvedere, and that's a lot of cricketers. There was all these soul uh, discos. And, uh, you know, the uh, Royal Oak, Nicky Holloway Special Branch with Bob Masters. Um, do at the zoo. Oh yeah, do at the zoo. Special bra. Oh, all them. Yeah, absolutely, man. That was wicked, yeah. wasn't it? I, I, I heard, I heard, Brandon. I heard you was a bit of a, a bit of a good dancer as well on the old dance floor. Yeah, I used to be able to sh shuffle a few moves, mate. I mean, I learned from some of the best dancers in London at the time, so very fortunate to be able to do that. I can't do any backs. My backs a bit ruined, and I can't do knee spins anymore. I can't do. Uh, Head spins, I definitely can't do. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, I, I mean, I still love a dance, mate. I do occasionally get a chance to have a little boogie, but uh, you know, the body's not not what it used to be, which um, it's a shame. But yeah, back in the day, we used to do some real cool dancing. And the re re record digging and you know sniffing out your crop, you know, is a huge part of be you know being a DJ. You know, where where was you buying your records from? So my mate John Jules, who's um, probably my mentor, but I've known him for you know, 20, 30 years, 35 years. We grew up all in, and Ricky, we all grew up in Wembley together. So John and Jules used to work in our price in Wembley, originally. Uh, and I think I bought my first 12-inch record there. But mostly I would go to either Bluebird. I worked in Black Market, by the way, with Ashley Beadle back in 1991, I think, or 92, for a bit. But also Ricky owned Catcher Groove, Blue, Blue, Bluebird in, in Edgware Road. Um, and then I, a lot of it, I worked in myself. Now listen to this for a lineup. <laughs> I worked. In, John Jules used to own a record shop in Rainers Lane, near where we used to live, called the Record Disco Centre. Uh, and at one point, there was me, Dean Thatcher, Simon Dunmore, Rocky. I can't remember who else. There was a couple of others who used to work. All, all, all working in the record shop at the same time. Wow! I mean, what, then, what 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 a lineup. It's great. It's just great fun, and you, 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 your peers you work with, and how they, you know, you know, success they've achieved. I mean, Simon, God, incredible. You know, uh, he man Rocky and Diesel and Express Two, and Dean Dean Thatcher with the, with the aloof, and Dick well the aloof, and he's he's now running the Northern Soul scene down in Margate, Dino. So he's doing fantastic things as well. Yeah, I'm meant I'm meant to be hopefully interviewing uh, Dean Thatcher, and I've also just interviewed um, Rocky from Express Two, Rocky as well. What wicked history! Yeah, incredible. Brandon, you know, we come from an era, there was like no internet. So club nights were basically promoted via the pirate radio stations and flyers or word of mouth. You know, you speak about down the pub, you know, what's going on tonight? And that's where you head off to. Can you yeah. tell me about the importance of radio, you know, pirate radio back then? Pirate radio has been up years. I mean, I used to listen to JFM and Victor and all those sort of, I mean, they were... They created the underground dance scene, didn't they? I mean, without those radio stations, you know, not half of these records wouldn't get played, especially not unless they were, you know, chart material, so they wouldn't get played on national radio. And so culturally, it was a great thing to It's invaluable, it's still invaluable. I mean, pirate radio stations probably don't exist now because you can just create internet radio stations. But I think radio is still probably the most listened to media. Even though the internet is available, but there's something really cool about having the radio you know like in the car and and, and you know just on the weekends you don't necessarily going to turn the computer on and have you might have your alexia who knows but i mean old school will probably just turn the radio on and have whatever their favorite station is playing in the background and you're totally right because you know the pirate radio stations they were playing the music that was not being played on the commercial stations pirates had a massive part didn't they and also promotion promotion of of, of the clubs absolutely i mean that's how it was. That's how it was built out. As you say, flyers, mm. um, word of mouth, and radio. That was it. There was, Brandon, no, as you say, the first mobile phones were just to give directions to the next raid. Brandon, do you remember that going like leaving leaving a club and like you'd be handed like flyers outside outside the club and you'd end up coming home with like. A wad of a, a wad of flyers in your in, in, in your you wouldn't know what to do and you stick them you'd stick them up on on your bedroom wall wouldn't you? I did have them on my bedroom wall. Yeah, yeah. 
It was brilliant. Yeah, like, yeah, you're and great. As the time went on, the packs got bigger and bigger and bigger. Like <laughs> yeah, the book. and, the, and heavier. Like yeah. The book. yeah, yeah, it was like reading a book. And then, I mean, look, businesses created out of that. The Flying Squad. A massive business was created by, like, for the, you know, the Flying Squad used to deliver the big packs of flyers. They created a massive business out of that. Some of them flyers were amazing. Did you have any kind of a few, fa you know, favourite flyers that you used to like to, you know, look at? It was There were so many, weren't there? There were so many good I flyers. Mean, I, I think some of the branding from back in the day was really cool. There were so many great, you know, flyers. But, I mean, typically the most famous and, and, and probably, you know, recognisable was still the Spectrum flyer. Mm. The eye it was Dave Little, a friend of ours, designed. Um... And then obviously the Balearic Beats album, the Boys Own Flyer, the Shim Flyer, sure, all those, yeah. you know, all those. I mean, yeah, I mean, some of the designs were absolutely incredible. I mean, they, they spent so much money on getting them. <coughs> Yeah. And, all, and, all, and also, Brandon, some of them flyers as well, they, some of them flyers were actually hand-drawn as well. Because this is a time b b before all this, like, you know, Apple Mac stuff and, like, you know, and... You, you, well, it well, yeah, no, well, you, you had to be very clever to be able to design a graphic design on a computer-aided design, a CAD, wasn't it? Because it wasn't used like it is now. So, yeah, I'm sure a lot, a lot of them were designed by hand and... and, and the human hand is incredible so yeah really good you know what made you want to become a dj as well brandon was it like because you just wanted to you know play music that you loved in front of a crowd and get people partying i don't know i, I think i think it was just a, 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 a i don't know if any if i didn't have that decision i was going to become a dj because even back then it wasn't you know turntablism hadn't really hit the because you, you couldn't see it anywhere unless you was actually in a club or in a record shop or part of dmc so I think for me, I love my music. I found it as my my, my great outlet. I fell into it. Yeah. You know, me, me and my mate, my best mate Ali, Ali Joe, we 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 started doing this gig at the part the pub on the Friday night, but the the other gigs didn't turn up. So the the boss went, "Come on, you two, go and get. You. I know you've got loads of records at home. Go and get and come back and you know fill the night for us." So we went home, put our milk crates up with the records in, come back to the pub. Played records all night. It went off. He said, "Well, you know, we might as well stay on and do it." And we, 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 on the back of that, we got, we got gigs to play at other pubs in the group. Um, we went and bought gear. We went, you know, we bought a sound system. We went and bought all the stuff we needed. Bought a van. Bought, you know, uh, went for it and um, started getting gigs elsewhere. And then we was also going to various nightclubs, Ombre's particularly in London at that time for us, as well as. Uh, Occasional funk club, etc. But on was really cool as well. It was great. It, it progressed from there, and, and and slowly DJing became, you know, a, a big thing. And, and you, uh, you know, the, the more, the more, the more, the more the clubs open, the more we wanted to play, and and you know, it became the job. You know, I'd say it's the job. It's never been the job as such. Been very fortunate to have been able to do this for years. But you know, having that moment when you play the right record and people go mad, it's it's. You know, it's uncomparable, really. I know it's just, a, you know, that, you know, hair stand up moment, isn't it? It's one of those things you're doing something. But you know, you really, now we know that, you know, those nights that people need to go out. And in fact, if you can play music and make people enjoy themselves or let people enjoy themselves, it's fantastic. It was so exciting. I mean, I remember going to, I was a member of Flying and we used to go flying a lot and all that. I uh, started flying, you know that? No. Me, Dean Thatcher, and Charlie Chester. Oh, yeah, no, I know Charlie. Yeah, it's, um, no, I didn't, re didn't realize yeah. he was one of the ones that started it. Wow. Me, Dean, and, Ch me and Dean, me and Dean were doing our own night at Hayden Stables in Ealing. Uh, I've known Dean for years, by the way. And we were doing our own night in Ealing, and, and then um, Queens started on a Sunday with Phil Perry, started doing Queens. And um, we got on with the geezer, Bruce, the owner, and said, we'd like to do a Tuesday night if we could. And um, he said, well, yeah, that's all right. We spoke to Phil about it. He's all right. We booked him, etc." And then um, me and Dean, well, Dean said, look, I've got a mate of mine, Charlie, he's, he's good. He knows a lot of people. He could probably help us promote this. And I said, well, I don't, it's cool. So he said to Charlie, can you, uh, do you want to help promote this night? We're going to start up at Queen. And Charlie said, yeah, I'd love to. And, and Dean got the flyer drawn by Dave Little again, came up with the name Flying because he, he'd seen we were flying at the time, and this saxophone player, he thought that would be a great flyer, and it was. And we started the club together, and then we started the, and then things changed, let's say. But yeah, I was 
we were so we did start flying together. So, yeah. yeah, it's a w- wicked club. Oh, it's so old theatre, wasn't it? And you used to go oh, downstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ali, Ali on the door as well, and like that's, yeah. Ali's, that's who I was just talking about. No, yeah. is that Ali? Yeah. Oh, Ali's wicked. Oh, say hello to Ali. I love loved him, man. He was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Got, me and Ali, me and Ali. Yeah, we were DJ partners back in '83. No, I never knew that. Yeah, Ali, Ali's wicked geezer. Yeah, say please say hello to him. But yeah, he was he was great on the door, you know, and um, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. Brandon, like the Balearic Island Ibiza, really is a ma- magical place, and you fell in love with it big time. I mean, um, what makes uh, you know Ibiza so special? I mean, is it a combination of like the music, the weather, and everything else? So basically, look. I was, you know, my um, my mate all went and took his own life. We were we were partying like really hard. And look, I bumped into Alex when um, we um, on one of her one fateful evening, and we we'd heard about each other being sort of pretty crazy, let's say. So we managed to that club I was doing with Dean Thatcher I mentioned. Um, the evening session started, and um, they used to have me as the resident, but then we'd, they would have guest DJs because by that time of the evening, I probably wasn't in the greatest states of all by any means. So um, the guest the DJ one week was Alex, and 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 I met him. I arrived at the. Uh, the <laughs> I've been out all day. I turned so I went back up there to to play the last set, and um, Alex was uh, playing, and I walked in and put something on the the, the turntable before the record finished and he had to get rid of it if you're saying and he i went i'm brandon block nice to meet you that was our intro we lost touch again after that for a little bit but then went over there actually with charlie chester to do a reconnaissance mission to set up the ib for 90 you know the um the weekend we did the the, the weekend uh what's it called it um a short film about chilling mm. the actual ib first white ib for pilgrimage weekend to buy a promoter let's say we took to Primal Scream, Weverall, Oki, you know, Rocky. I went out there with him to, to look at the place and try and find where he's going to put his bands, and never, he never took me back again, Chester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrible. But, um, yeah, so then I, he went out, but then I went back on my own with Baggy that, later that year, and we said we're going to go and live there for a bit of time. And when I got there, everyone was going, oh, Alex is looking for you, Alex is looking for you. And I said, well, you know, we, we found him after he'd been out. With the, the incredible story when Nick the, the bus, the passenger bus. I don't know if you've heard of that. Story. Is, that is, it, is that when you took the, uh, took the passenger bus from one island to the other? Not one of them night night buses. It, yeah, sort of. But one of is a normal, not a night bus, a normal passenger bus. The driver had gone to the toilet. He come out of pasture for I can't get home, so he jumps on the bus and drove it to San Juan full of people. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, full of uh, club, full of full of club. What was there any club? Was there any clubbers on it, or was this in the daytime? No, it was at night after Pasha. I was up uh, right, right. So oh, the that, early morning work bus, I suppose, for the other people. Like a night uh, bus. That's, that's so funny. It is funny. So anyway, look, we met up, and he said that please. We we had a bit of a, a session the first night. We got together. He said, "Come to my club in the morning." I think he'd opened space that year, or the yeah. The, the, yeah. The, maybe the year before, but it, it was slowly building. So I come to my club in the morning and play. I went, oh, I'd love to. So I turned up in the morning, walked into the space, and went, oh my God, look at this place. And um, and I put my records behind the decks with him. We played all day. It went off. And then literally that, that afternoon, that or that morning, Pepe came to Alex and said, or oh, came to me and said, I want you to work here with Alex. I'll give you a social security number and get you employed and stuff. So... They did all that, I and mean, that was it. That was history. Was like, the rest is history, as they say. We just, uh, you know, you had you, you you parted for a good few years. Well, yeah, not only that, but we was you know instrumental in making a daytime partying a thing. Mm. You know, that's the first day, the first uh, after hours in the world. Yeah, yeah. Because what time did space open? Like six or seven in the morning. Yeah, and you know, six o'clock inside in the morning, which was the you know the inside. Full on, and all yeah. we a black a black room with LEDs in. So it's crazy, uh, Brandon. It's crazy, isn't it? Because you used to like come out of a club at like four or four in the morning or whatever, and then suddenly go to space, and you was like back in as if like it was night time again. Because it was all you know, and you'd be walking like to the club in the bright daylight when the sun had risen, and you yeah. was going back into this kind of nighttime, you know, like a club. 
it was yeah. and and space i mean how good is space i mean the sand system i mean everything about it wicked club yeah incredible it was just it was a standalone club in all honesty you know patrick amnesia and coup were and it's probably these all beautiful beautiful clubs special special clubs yeah they're yeah, special in their own they, they're all so unique and nothing mm. like anywhere else in the world so that's why i speak you know i be for and then there was like a hidden gem until you know that that sort of opening up of um when alfredo was playing all the valeric stuff and you know um yeah a wonder a incredible world incredible times it was so good and and you know the good thing with space in the in the, in the, in the terrace at the back is when the planes used to fly over everyone yeah. would scream way like yeah, go yeah, yeah. go yeah it was it was brilliant wasn't it random fantastic mate fantastic yeah i mean i can't believe that with the bus that's uh that's that's a classic isn't it i never knew that <laughs> but you know I, I, you, you know you you and alex p i mean you know you are just like you you're a bit a little bit like laurel and hardy you are so funny together you know you're you're, you're great you're fantastic as well as being you know wicked djs you're 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 beautiful people as well i mean you really are characters do you know what i mean diamond geezers you, that's very nice of you to say we've had some fun yes let's say that I yeah you, i bet i bet i bet you've had uh had, had a lot of fun um and you know was it basically was it ib for when you really started you know to say right you know I, I've, I've done way too much here it's getting out of control i need to stop or was you a little bit too far gone and people pushed you to say no, that no, Brandon... no, no, no. It, was, it was never that to anyone else right people people never push me never you know I, mean, I was always my own worst enemy let's say uh so so you uh, yeah, usually sorry so so you said to yourself it's time to sort myself yeah, I out can't do no one else was telling me what to do and no one else no. can think yeah. about it mate no one can tell you what to do no nah. no you're uh, you right, know, it's not there, you're it's right. Not there. you know people may suggest things people may have concerns which is great and it's very nice but until you're ready to do it you won't do it mm. that's the mm. thing it's got to, it's got to matter it's got to have it's got to have a reason behind it it's got to have a, a, a you know you, you if you say just stop and there's no reason for it or no no passion or, there's no motivation to do it let's say then you're not going to do it there's got to be reasons there's got to be something to do with it's just got to be powerful enough to make you go right that decision this don't work anymore i've got to change but you know it's me i got i got to a stage where i i i, I was i was ill really ill physically Ill as well as mentally ill right um and i was just struggling and, and, and I, I couldn't do anymore i literally was on a journey to do away with myself and i was ready to accept that but it wasn't happening and i was getting more and more pain from the physical illness so i decided one incredible morning when i was sitting in the hospital waiting for more bloody painkillers and drugs to be given to me and they said no way that my mind just went i've had enough i've had enough of this life i've had enough of this but now it's time now to stop and that's when it that's when the reality hits home that you've not got to change your whole life and um i'm very fortunate that managed to stay alive through it and you know and i think for people who are listening i think you know what now we live in a world which is really tough um there's lots of things going on and you know, the thing about it the thing that's good thing about it now is there's lots of support which is great and lots of people who have a and empathy and understanding. I want you to get hope that loads of people won't judge you anymore. If you need help, you can reach out and ask for it, and don't be afraid to do so because that's what we're here for. That's what humans are supposed to be doing, helping each other. So um, back then, it was very. It, it wasn't as open. There was no internet. It was no nothing. You know, it was, it was quite a raw. And I, I sort of did it mostly on my own, so it was tough. But. And I didn't do, I didn't do, I didn't take medication. I was on, they get the prescribing medication in the hospital for like three weeks. And I said, as soon as I got out, I went, don't want any of this. I stopped everything, literally. I just didn't want anything in my, in my mind. I went through the journey of, you know, getting, rewiring my mind and getting better and, you know, learning to live life without the use of substances, uh, you know, drugs. And it's, it's just a, 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 a a journey mate and you, you know it, it changes from day to day but yeah i mean look 96 was my year i was very very ill they were saying in ib if you've got to go home mate you, you know you don't look well you're not you're not well 
and I was sort of, nye, 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 nye. I'll do it my own way. And then I did, I, I sort of, I semi took their advice and left because I was feeling unwell anyway. You know, I told you I wasn't well. And the way it came home from, and I, I had to start finding out how to get help because in 96, it was unheard of pretty much drug addiction or you know problems with that wasn't talked about because it was all anonymous and 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 it wasn't as widespread because it wasn't available it was you know so i had to find help which i did in the in, in the shape of dr william shanahan who's a, a very my mentor and also the psychiatrist head psychiatrist the primary priory uh he's still my mentor now to this day 26 years down we still speak because i started doing the work obviously and when i started doing the work he said i'll, I'll support you with you know training not training you know but support you with some advice if you need help with your cases and stuff like that so we still keep in touch and he um he now refers people to me would you believe to 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 help with those um stuff and i'm running, a couple, of I'm running a couple of groups at the moment online and, and whatsapp where we support each other um so yeah i mean yeah it was me <laughs> Brandon, what were the kind of like the first steps though? In, in, in you know, when you was that ill, what were the first steps you had to take? I mean, to, to, did you have to switch off from everything, like literally not go out, not see any of your mates, and just switch no. off from it all? No, I didn't. I didn't believe in any of that. I was. I just. I said to myself, look, I've just got to stop doing this. And, mm. and as soon as I stopped doing it, I went to. The, well, I saw Bill. My my the stoker, I saw. I saw Bill. And he said, look, I can save your life, but you need to come in the clinic like now. Mm. And I said, okay. And that was a weekend. I went there. I won't say about the weekend pre leading up to when I went in, because it, you know, I said it was going to be a quiet one. It turned out being the, the biggest one I've ever had in my life. But I knew that was going to happen. You know, it was normal. It was like a, a, a swan song, let's say. The suggestions made to me were that you need to mm. stop DJing, don't see your friends, do this, do that. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to stop taking drugs and that's what I'm going to do. Mm. So I was quite strong in my intention and decision making at that time to do that. So, but I then went straight back to my people the next season and I went, I went to carry on DJing and I went out. I just had a friend with me, who, you know, a very old friend who looked after, pretty much looked after me, drove me everywhere, protected me, I suppose, said, look, don't go near him with any of that, blah, blah, blah. But I, not that I was going to go back. I never relapsed. I never wanted that to be. I just never wanted it again. I didn't want. I didn't want to. I didn't have. I played that game too many times for like ten years, and I just wasn't going to do that again. You, you was just sick of it. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I, did, I had the same thing. I, 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 I nearly. Uh, I was kind of on my way out as well. I was drinking too much and smoking too much and all that and i think you just get to a point in life when you wake up you know your kidneys are hurting you're turning yellow and you're sweating at night shaking and all this stuff and you just say i, I i've had enough of it i don't want to go through this anymore it's making you so ill and you're getting all this pain that you just you you, you can't do it anymore you just can't do it to yourself no absolutely i'll make you right and you know it's those moments when you have to remember why you did what you did. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. So, yeah, I, I, I came to the up limit decision myself. I found help from a few people who sorted me out, where to tell me where to go. But I, I went and checked myself in and I went on my own. You know, I didn't go, people dropped me off or anything. I just went. And I, my mate, I knew I needed to go and I went on the Monday morning after that mental weekend that I had. And I actually DJed the Ministry of Sound the night before I went in. And I had about, I can't even, I won't even tell you how much I took, but it was way out of the league, way out of my league for that. It was like a, a, the last try, let's say. It was like the last supper. There was like the last supper, last mm. supper. Last, last supper. supper, supper, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the last supper. That's quite good, that. I'm, like, I'm going to keep that one. <laughs> the bank of supportive affirmations. <laughs> <laughs> the, last, the last supper, I love it. <laughs> yeah. But but um, it's, it's, it, Brandon, it's so true. You you get to that certain stage where you think that's it. It's it's yeah. over. It's over. It's over. Is that, I well, can't. Yeah, I mean, and, that, and and the thing about you, we've got to be very grateful for is we actually managed to get to that place before it went too far. Because unfortunately, mm. people. <laughs> Oh, some people don't get there and, and, and before it's too late, let's say. So this is why I say to people who are listening and you're struggling, reach out. 
make sure you do because it, you know if, it, if you want to reach out to me you can find me on messenger or i don't use facebook often or instagram i suppose but steve anyone we can signpost you can help you out with people to talk to or where you need to go anything like that um but as i say don't suffer in silence as they say always always speak out and um what i'll do i'll put some links in the description box below where people can get in touch with you me or or, or, or yeah, any, yeah, anyone yeah. else where because it's all it's all about spreading you know this kind of positivity and pushing people forward because all, all that's going to do eventually is bring you down down and and, and it'll blow blow your brain i mean I, I've, I've got a couple of friends that, that are actually still inside like from 20 30 years ago in, in mental institutions I mean, yes, it's it's a very fine line you got up. You know, you're you're walking a lot often because you don't know what, especially nowadays. I mean, that thirty years ago we were sort of pretty much knew. Well, we thought we knew what we was getting, but now it's who knows. You know, it, it, it's just dangerous. It's the the world's dangerous. You know, that whole that whole world's dangerous, and you've got to be mindful so I, I get what you're saying i had friends who lost lost the plot as well back in the day and still never and never never fully recovered and it's quite frightening you know in the in the pursuit of let's say i don't know what is it the pursuit of happiness or the pursuit of human experience or experiences out of our normal comfort or, or out of our normal world we take risks and the brain you know the brain is a very powerful thing but it's also a very very delicate thing as well and you start pumping all this all this stuff inside you know inside your body inside your head it ain't gonna do you no favors eventually man it's you're no, gonna it's, like it's fall a, apart it's, it's a tough one mate it's a tough one but listen more positively we've got loads of help out there for people if they, if they, if they, if they need it obviously and and you know um be mindful and uh, hmm. And reach, out. Reach, and, and, re reach out. and reach out and there's some brilliant people out there doing amazing things i mean i've got a friend of mine old friend of mine from back in the day chris hill he's doing great stuff i know chris very well i'm just but, about to start my coaching program again which uh, i've been working on so that's based on some life blockages and stuff can can we uh can we put in some links or something below uh brandon where well, the, the life blocks i can send you once i've once i've sort of put it out again i'm supposed to be talking to someone this week about where i'm going to market it's going to be on my website so basically brandonblock.com will be up and running again soon it's up now but I'm, i won't be interacting just yet but the the, the life blocks will be on there so people cool. will be able to access well that. what i'll do i'll put the brandonblock.com website in yeah, the description perfect brandonblock.com and click on that and reach out to you know brandon if, if if you need some help or some encouragement some advice anything just just that one step forward in in the right direction all that little things as well brandon if you know if you do it all do it all again would you change anything no I, i've thought about this before would i change anything i think if i look if i had a different awareness and i knew about stuff i would probably have just not been so hard on yourself yeah it made myself so ill mm. you know but i wouldn't change the party and i wouldn't change the the the, the, the career i wouldn't change the journey uh, i definitely wouldn't change the opportunities i've had and you know the experiences i've been been able to dj in, you know around the world and with fantastic people and meet all the you know musos i've met now listen mate i've had a fantastic life up to now and it's you know it's not it's not finished by any means you know i've got a, uh lovely life let's say i'm very grateful to be here uh we're blessed you know we're blessed and this is a very very short life that we live and we need to grab hold of whatever we have and you know and, and we, we need to love ourselves we need to push positivity and shut out all that negative stuff out of our lives and just try and just try and be good people absolutely just be nice to each other and that's yeah. wonderful and I'd also um, like to quickly talk about, you know, the book as well. You wrote a book called The Life and Lines of Brandon Block. Can, is that basically about your life story and, you know, how it all kind of panned out for you? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it does what it says on the tin, really, The Life and Lines. I mean, I, I, I spent, you know, I suppose my life was more in the public eye when we were partying in Ibiza and, and doing, you know, becoming the crazy people we were. 
And I just had a lot of people kept saying, oh, you should, write, you should write a book, you should write a book. And I didn't know any, I didn't have any reason or motivation behind writing the book. It was only once I'd stopped doing the drugs and that, that I realised that, and being able to do that after 10, like, like, like so it was 12, 2010 we started, so I'd been off the year 14 years. It was only then that I realised that there was actually maybe there's something I could share and uh, it may help people or may give some people a, 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 a way to start looking for help. Uh, and, and and I managed to find my old mate, Matt Trollope, who worked with DJ Mag, he used to follow me and Alex around back in the day. And he, uh, he was a journalist and he was only in a bar actually with um, Stuart Patterson in, um, in uh, Harlesden. I went in one night after Carnival and, and uh, I see him and I said, look, do you fancy writing my book? He went, yeah, why not? Well, I'll be honest with you, you could turn your life story into a film. I mean, you know, it's like you've had, a, had an incredible journey. Thank you, mate. And for what, you know, for what you've come through, as I said at the start of this interview, you're like the phoenix that has now come out of the flames. You've seen the light, but you've just turned into someone where, you know, you could like turn to, have a nice chat with, and you know, you're, 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 you're such a, as I said from the start, you're such a sound diamond bloke, uh, Brandon. You know, you're, you. very, you're very approachable. You're, you're, you're one of a kind. And I mean, and as I say, when, when, when you and Alex peer together, you're basically, you're absolutely, I'd, I'd love to interview Alex as well. He's, he's another, like, well, wicked he'll, character. He'll, he'll, do, he'll do an interview for you. Of course he will. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I really appreciate it. It's very nice for you to say that. Uh, but I think, you know, what I've learned is that deep down, every human has a, a desire or a, an innate, it's called innate means inside. We need to, to, to be, to be nice. You know, it's, it's, you know, I think, you know, we have this desire to give back, this desire to help people. Eventually, things will happen in your life where you, you, you know, you've come out of the other side of certain situations. It can be anything. It can be, you know, life changes on a daily basis. So it can be anything you've come through, which was, which you were finding difficult and achieving that goal and becoming, you know, uh, oh, I've done that. How, how good do I feel? And, you know, you're allowed to do that. It's not, you know, you're allowed to feel good about something. You're allowed to feel good about helping people. And if something makes us feel bad, then we've got to leave it out. Don't know what anyone says. Just if that makes you feel bad, then leave it. I mean, it's difficult, but you've got to start saying no to things. I found it much easier more of late to say no to certain things, which I would never have done. It's all about people pleasing, isn't it? And I've just actually, yeah, I've managed to find that little voice to say no. Well, I suppose what you've got to do as well is say no to the negative stuff, but say yes to the positive stuff. So positive stuff is kind of like things like being creative, drawing, writing, making music, you know, doing a good deed for someone, doing what you're doing, pushing positivity, channel that addiction, that negative addiction into channeling positive, positive addiction and giving out, you know, because what I'm doing, like doing this, doing this like little YouTube thing, whatever it is, you know, this is kind of a little bit like an addiction It's pushing positivity. I'm talking to, no, you know, like legends like yourself, you know, it's making me feel happy talking to you sitting here now. It's making you, you know, this is, like, this, this is the, this is the, this is the power of the internet and that you've been able to now have a voice and share nice things like the thing i did in lockdown the tune-up when i had all the djs coming on every morning i don't, I don't know if you saw it or not but we did i had uh I, it turned out i was just interviewed after i got scott mack on the first day and i just got him on ecam this thing like skype and me and ricky were obviously we were in lockdown so we we're in our own houses and then we invited scott on we had a chat played a couple of tunes which he liked it was a nice little chat and then the next morning we said we'll do it again and again and again we ended up doing it for eight months and like each morning it turned out we had a, a um like a day for the old soul boy soul boy so gordon mack and so, uh, bob masters and bloody blah and then we had uh, the, the house heads and i had old son dave Durrell and pat tony and graham park and all my mates from clubland We'd come on and alex obviously we had the girls morning yeah so yeah I mean, I mean you know we had all sorts of little different things going on every um every day which is love bit which is and it changed people's lives so i was going to speak quickly say as well how do you what do you do do you do, do you meditate do you uh do you try i'm just done i've just done four rounds of wim hof breathing you do wim hof yeah uh i went 
I've got my jacuzzi, no, I say my jacuzzi, it's not a jacuzzi, it's one in rubber hot tubs, but I'm not turning the heat on, I'm not adding the heat on at all, so... So you have the cold, the cold tub? I'm going to go and do that at lunchtime, j- jump in there for a bit, it's a bit of a shocker. I went in the sea this morning, well, I do that every day in Bournemouth now, I've been to my bike ride. So because, yeah. because, of, because all this stuff is, once again, it's go, going in a positive flight, a positive direction. You know, all, all that Wim Hof, the, the meditation, the breathing techniques, you know, uh, doing a bit of exercise, even going out, just go out for a walk, get your heart rate up and all that. It, it releases positive endorphins into the brain. It's, you know, it, it's all really positive, isn't it, Brandon? Absolutely, mate. It really, really is. You know, and, and I procrastinate about that, but when I do it, I feel great. So, you know, the, breathe, the, the, the breathing this morning just grounded me, cleared your head. Mm. And the sea does that as well. Oh yeah, you're uh, lucky. You're lucky to live by the sea and not like me by the Thames. Yeah, well, well I used to. Live in London, I mean, I've been. I grew up in London, and I just, I just like it here better. It's more chilled, hundred percent. It's, it's a lot more, a lot more, a lot more chilled. But listen, Brandon, it's been an absolute wicked chat, and we must try and do a part two because I've got quite a few other little questions to ask you. Mate, yeah, I'm um, more than happy to do a part two with you. And, and I know I know this has been an early one, and you know, the stuff we've spoke about before, you've gone over it a hundred times, but I was actually more uh, interested in talking about the positive stuff that you're, you're giving back, you know, and I must say, I salute you, and I salute everybody else that are really trying to push people in the right direction and back onto track, Get rid of all that negativity. That's the way forward. Well done, mate. And you know, keep your message going out there. It's great. And it's been lovely talking to you as well, bro. No, hundred percent, man. And listen, anyone watching this, subscribe to the channel. I've interviewed like Johnny Rocker, uh, Jay Strongman, uh, Rocky from Express Two, Chucky from Tonka Sand System, Public Enemy, Man Parish. Um, the list goes on. So um, listen. All I can say is, Brandon, it's been an honour, and we salute you. Thank you, bruv, really. I really enjoyed it. Didn't I, I know you, mate. I didn't know you interviewed, Rock, interviewed Rocker, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny Rocker, yeah, it was a wicked interview. Yeah. I love Johnny, man. I've seen him for years. He's lovely. I'll, say, I'll send you his, his interview. All right, wicked. But listen, I really want to chat him, Brandon, and keep, keep, keep it moving. You're doing amazing stuff, really. Thank you, mate. Peace, peace from the southeast. Peace from the South Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. Cheers, yeah, mate. Bye, mate. Cheers, mate.